Hello, friends, both old and new, and welcome to the 12 Senses 2021 Sensing Justice in the Encounter pre-conference lecture series. My name is Paige Hartzell, and today we will hear from Richard Steele and his lecture, Carl Koenig, The Refugee Who Started a World Movement. Richard has had a long and deep relationship with Carl Koenig and the Camp Hill Movement, having completed training at the Camp Hill Seminar for Curative Education in 1975. Prior to that, he studied linguistics. Until 2008, he lived and worked with his family in a Camp Hill community for children and young people with special needs in Germany. Since 2008, Richard has been building up the Carl Koenig Institute, which he co-founded. He also helped build a Camp Hill community for older people in New York State. Richard is a speaker, writer, and poet, and is responsible for the Carl Koenig Work Edition. Currently, there are over 84 million people, over 26 million children, who have been forcibly displaced from their homes, refugees, as was Carl Koenig. We are honored to have Richard here to speak about Koenig's experiences and his calling to birth the Camp Hill movement. May we find threads that connect us across time to his experience and the theme of this conference. Richard, welcome. Thank you, Paige. So I'm gonna say a little bit about Carl Koenig's biography and how we found the Camp Hill movement, particularly because he was the one that caused these conferences about the 12 senses. The first one last year, 2020, was 60 years after his first visit to North America, where he gave these talks about the 12 census. And that was the last year's conference was to commemorate these, this series of very special lectures. But how did he get there? So we're going back to the beginning of the last century because Karl Koenig was born 1902 in Vienna in Austria. And that was still the huge empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it was a very special situation because he was born into a Jewish family. And Jewish people hadn't been allowed to live in the city for a very long time. So it was uh, quite a, uh, a special situation for him, for his family, to found a place to live and work in the city amongst other Jewish people who had mainly come the previous generation, usually out of the countryside with hardly any means to live by. So there was poverty also in the Jewish quarters of the city. And Karl Koenig grew up, of course, in a, a very particular time of history. He was 12 years of age when the First World War started. And at the age of 14, he experienced how the last emperor of this huge empire of Austro-Hungary was taken to his grave. And he, he knew as a youngster already that this was a turning point in time in some way. And he experienced also that his own destiny had to do with this special time. He was very awake as a youngster to questions like this. Another thing that he was awake to on his way to school in the city of Vienna, he passed a building with a motto carved into stone. And this motto said, what you have done to the least of my brethren, you have done unto me. Now, of course, as a, a Jewish child, he couldn't know where that came from. It was from the gospel of St. Matthew and the story of the Good Samaritan. There was a little statue of the Good Samaritan also on that building. But he didn't know. He just found this was such a special motto. And it almost became, or did really become, the motto of his own life. He told stories about this very often in later life, too, how this influenced him. And he was striving towards this ideal. And when he found out that this was, these were words of Christ, he realized that he was looking for a new form of Christianity, a deed Christianity, I'd like to call it. 
And it is of interest, possibly, that in the same year he was born, Rudolf Steiner published a book called Christianity as Mystical Fact. That's what the English title is. In actual fact, if you translate the German title of this book, the original title, it reads more like Christianity as mystical deed, not fact. So it's of interest that actually his biography fits into the historical situation, of course, but also has this parallel uh, development to what was happening with the development of anthroposophy. That book was born in the same year he was. So looking for this new Christianity, this deed Christianity as a youngster, something developed in him that he later called social conscience or also historic conscience, realizing how he had a task for the world of his time and for the future. And this knowing of the connection between his own destiny and the destiny of his time brought him also to the fact that he would want to be a healer. He did study medicine then, but it was deeper than just medicine. He knew that his time needed healing, the world needed healing. And that was his ideal as a youngster already. I think one can say as a 14, 15 year old, during the First World War, he already had these ideals within him. And as a student, he had the same questions really that Charles Darwin had had just exactly 100 years previously. Questions of the development of mankind, the development of humanity altogether. How does the human being develop? And this was not just a, a scientific questioning, but it was very much geared to this will to heal for Karl Koenig. So in that way, different to the path of Darwin. It led Karl Koenig to the Embryological Institute and to study embryology in depth, of which he spoke for the rest of his life, linking embryology and the development of the physical development, the anatomical development of the human being, actually to world history. And through this questioning and experience in the science of embryology, he came to meet Goetheanism, and through this, in turn, to anthroposophy. It was still a question to him if this was going to be his path, but very soon he met through the question of Goetheanism, he met Eugen Kulitsko, who was a teacher of Goetheanist thinking. So this was a very definite path for Karl Koenig towards his future. He realized that is where he was going to find the answers to his deep questions about the human being. So through this, he actually, in the end, became a member of the Anthroposophical Society, but only after really questioning himself and going through, well, of course, the experiences a youngster has to go through. He became a socialist. Socialist movement in, in Austria was very new. As I say, the last emperor had only just died, and so socialism was a very new movement. And he became very, very involved with religious questions, the question of the connection between Jewish religion and Christianity and other religions, but also the question of healing of society, social questions. And then he found that actually the answers were within anthroposophy. Becoming a member in 1925, of course, he didn't realize that Rudolf Steiner was on his deathbed at that time. And before he could actually visit the Goethe Amum in Dornach in Switzerland, Rudolf Steiner had already died. This is something he regretted for the rest of his life, that he was not able to meet the person who became his, really, his teacher. But the person he did meet was actually Ita Wegmann. She was the one who 
together with Rudolf Steiner, developed antiposophical medicine and became the leader of the medical section of the Antiposophical Society. But more than this, she was also someone who was really convinced that medicine had to be within a social setting. Medicine was also, let's say, a medicine for social life. And so these ideals that Karl Koenig carried within him were to be found within this personality of Peter Wegmann. They became very great friends. First of all, she asked him to write essays about embryology through the lens of anthroposophy. This was quite a, a new theme. So he published a few essays for her. But then after meeting her, he realized he needed to work together with her. And she invited him to Switzerland to be an assistant in the first anthroposophical clinic in Arlesheim, where he then went in 1957. He would not long become a doctor, so he was very young. And she wanted him nevertheless to lecture about, um, about embryology, but also about the anthroposophic view of the human being, about the study of the human being for young doctors, for nurses, for therapists, for eurythmists. So he was giving many, many courses in Switzerland. Yeah, also, he was asked by Ita Wigman to assist in the clinic for people with special needs, Sonnenhof. This was his first meeting with such people, really, and it was new to him, but he was very excited about the experience of these people. He realized that, in actual fact, these people with special needs, these children, were very good teachers, teaching about the human being, one could learn about the human being specifically from these people in a very special way. One could also learn about oneself. And that is where he really found his future task. That is what he says later. He realized, yes, this is my future to work together with people with special needs or the special needs of the earth and of humanity. So it's a working together that he was interested in. So with this connection to Isa Wegmann, he also went to Germany and co-founded one of the first anthroposophical homes for curative education, together with the person who became his wife, Tilla Marsberg. There in Silesia, they built up Pilgrimshain, a home for people with special needs. Of course, it was not an easy time. This was in 1929 when he made this move to Germany, to Silesia. And there, of course, it became politically more and more difficult, socially more and more difficult, until in the end, he also had to flee from Germany back to Austria, then to Switzerland and via France to Britain. He was a refugee, but on a number of levels because he was a Jewish person. He was also an anthroposophist. That was a reason to flee at that time. But he was also a person who was no longer wanted within the anthroposophical society. This is a very difficult chapter of the Anthroposophical Society because it wasn't easy for people from the Jewish religion at that time, particularly in Switzerland. And at the same time, he was somebody who was very um, authentic with his study and with the way he um, talked about, the way he lectured about anthroposophy, about the study of the human being and particularly his theme on embryology, which was quite new as a lecture theme at the time. So he was actually not welcome there at that time. And uh, he, through various difficulties, he had to flee actually from the Anthroposophical Society. He was dismissed in 1935 
as well as Ita Wegmann from the Anthroposophical Society. But he was also someone who lived and worked with people with special needs, which became also a reason to need to flee from Middle Europe. These people were being taken and also the euthanasia had started. So Koenig found himself in Britain, actually in the north of Scotland, where Ita Wegmann had friends. And maybe we can see the first picture now. There we would see the little group of refugees because he had a youth group in Vienna, young students of medicine mainly, but also other young people, mainly Jewish. With them, he'd worked together. And on the eve that the Germans moved into Austria, annexed Austria to the German state. When the troops moved into Austria, into Vienna, he sat with these young friends and they promised to meet somewhere, wherever it would be possible, to take this seed of anthroposophy, this seed of healing, to wherever it could be taken and to whichever part of the earth it could maybe in the future grow. So, in this picture, we see Karl Koenig with this little group of friends. In the front, we see his own children as well, four children. And then we see other children. The first children they actually took into this Kirkton house in Aberdeenshire in Scotland were refugees themselves. They were refugees because they had special needs but they were refugees because they were also Jewish. Now, one of these, for instance, on the left-hand side, the, in the second row, the young man, uh, he came from Germany. He was from a Jewish family, and his parents were able actually to flee from Germany and to go to the United States. But at that time, it was not possible for them to take a child with special needs with them. And they had heard that Karl Koenig was in Scotland and starting this initiative to a friend. So they asked if their child could go to Scotland. And Koenig, of course, said yes. So this young man was one of the first pupils in Kirkton House in Scotland. And he stayed with Karl Koenig in the, what became the Kampel movement until he died at the age of 80, not so long ago. And his parents went to America. His mother died there. His father was able to visit a few times before he also died. This was, I, I tell you a little bit about this because it is a typical destiny of that time. And these children who fled, who were able to get the Kindertransporte, is the name one usually uses, the transports that were arranged to get children out of Germany and Austria. It was mainly the Quakers and anthroposophists who actually organized these transports to get children out of the war, the beginning of the wartime, and particularly children with special needs, of course, who were in great danger. So the first children who were taken across to Britain, some of them went to Karl Koenig in Scotland. And it became a haven for people um, one could say, actually, until today, this element still lives in the Kempton movement. In a way, people with special needs are refugees from society, seeking refuge, seeking haven in times which are certainly different to the Second World War, but nevertheless, times where a haven is needed. So that is actually where the Campbell movement began in the north of Scotland. And Karl Koenig was quite clear that there a community should be
be created where anthroposophy could live in a way that could be a seed for the future. He was sure that actually anthroposophy was going to be completely destroyed in Central Europe and with it probably the impulse of Central Europe altogether, where anthroposophy had found its home and grown. Just there was the center of the Second World War. So Koenig took this very consciously as his impulse for the beginning of the Kempel movement. Now, right at the beginning of the war, 1939, of course, these people who had fled before the war already to England, to Scotland, were Germans, were German speaking, and were considered enemy aliens. And it's a bit of a parallel to our times that there was a, a rumor that actually amongst these refugees, there were spies. There were people who the Germans had consciously sent to these countries to be spies for the future war. And so all these refugees were collected up and taken as what they called them enemy aliens to internment camps and kept for varying lengths of time, some of them until the end of the war, before they were actually released and could become real refugees and find their new future. So Karl Koenig and also the other men who had fled with him were taken to internment camps. The women had to carry on this pioneering work, looking after the children, and this group of children was growing from month to month, with also British children joining them. The word had spread in Britain that this new initiative was taking place. And so also influential people in Britain the brother of the prime minister even wanted their children to go there. And so this little community grew and grew. And uh, they needed actually a bigger house. Kirkton House in the beginning was very, very small and uh, quite, how should one say, primitive because there was no electricity, there was no running water and there was no heating except for the fireplace, which was usual in British homes at the time. So one fireplace for the whole house, and there was already a, a group of co-workers there, um, Koenig with his family, and at that time then eight and then 10 and 12 children they had taken on in special needs. So they were looking for a new house, and at the time when the men were already in the internment internment camp and the women were left alone to look after house and children and gardens to grow the food also. There a house was offered to them by William Macmillan, by the way, who was famous because of his uh, book company and uh, he was the owner at that time of the flat iron building in New York City, which probably some of you will know. And his son was one of the children in the beginnings of Camp Hill in Kirkton House. Now, this Mr. McMillan helped them to find a bigger house. And this was called Camp Hill House in Aberdeen. And so, of course, they took it and the women and the children moved there. And the Camp Hill movement, so to speak, began outwardly through the women who did the nursing, the schooling, looking after the children, the, the education, but also doing the housework and the gardens and everything that had to be done, very consciously done, so that anthroposophy culture would permeate everything. And at the same time, the men were in the internment camp, most of them on the Isle of Man. I think that's a very strange thing. No men, it's all men one says. And so it was, the men were taken to the Isle of Man. And there, they were actually left quite free. But it was an island of professional people, of doctors, professors, artists, 
because the Jewish people who had been allowed into the United Kingdom were actually more or less all professional people. Normal people were not allowed. Doctors, particularly because one knew the war was coming, and during wartime one needs doctors. So these people got together in the internment camp and formed something like a, a little private university there with talks and lectures and concerts, even they were allowed to play musical instruments, there was a choir. And so it was quite a, a vibrant cultural life there. And this is where Karl Koenig, with this small group of people who then helped him to pioneer the Kampel movement, actually worked on the inner pioneering, the inner aims, the inner work that formed the Kampel movement. So, in a way, we have this interesting situation, the women doing the outer work and founding Kampil outwardly, and the men folk on this little island working intensively to find the spiritual center of what was then to become the Kampil movement. So, you see, when this movement actually, particularly after the war, of course, began to spread to the south of England and then to Ireland and into Central Europe, this was quite a, a special moment for Karl Koenig to experience that, yes, this seed had grown to become something quite special. This work of refugees with other refugees was becoming something like a model for society that was in a new phase of formation after the Second World War. So, in a way, we can see how what his aims were, what his hopes were before the Second World War, that this seed could be planted in um, good soil, was actually becoming true, was becoming real. And he could take these impulses, in a way, back to Central Europe, and also to other countries. And he was actually quite famous worldwide uh, and was, out of that, also invited to the United States. He had connections to various physicians in the United States, to professional people. And he had also had contact to a number of curative homes in the United States and was asked to visit and to help that Campbell could actually be founded in the United States. And this could actually take place in 1960. This was his first journey of two to North America. And during this first journey was this, in the meantime, famous cycle of lectures about the 12 senses. It's interesting that Karl Koenig chose this theme of the 12 senses to be his main theme when he went to the United States. One can ask, of course, why the 12 senses? Now, I can't answer that completely so easily, but I can say one thing. He knew that when Rudolf Steiner had begun to talk about the senses in 1909 in Berlin, that actually he said that the senses were the first chapter of a new understanding of the human being. So one could say the first chapter of anthroposophy. So going to North America, it was obvious, I think, for him in a way to start out of his experience with people with special needs speak about the 12 senses as this first stepping stone for him in, the, in North America. And it was quite a situation of destiny for him personally, also for the Campion movement that then began to grow within North America. But also I think for anthroposophy in America, it was quite a, an important situation. 
also for the study of the 12 senses. It was an important destiny situation because I think I can truthfully say that right until today, Karl Koenig's work on the senses is amongst the best and most thorough work on Rudolf Steiner's ideas about the 12 senses. So in a way, this course that he gave in America became quite central to the study of the 12 senses worldwide. Of course, Karl Koenig was not to know that at the time. But what he did experience going to North America, apart from a number of other things, but one thing very particularly was that he realized this seed of anthroposophy, this seed of the Central European impulse, in a way also this seed of new Christianity, needed to be taken to the periphery, from the center to the east and to the west. And that the east and the west would need to work together to balance the influences of each other so that a new center could arise, seeing the, the human being of the future or future society as this new center. He found it extremely important that in America there would be this work on the 12 senses, this first step to understanding the human being and for the company movement to be able to move towards the West. Afterwards, he was very keen that the company movement would go to the East. Unfortunately, of course, it was a, a time that was again very difficult to go East because places where he'd already held lectures and had contacts were then communist countries and he was not allowed to take his work there. He'd been to the east of Germany, to Hungary, to the Czech Republic, and wanted also to go further east. That was no longer possible also because Karl Koenig died in the year 1966. So there was not the time really to make this step towards the east. I'm sure he would be incredibly happy to know that now the company movement has and been taken to the East, to India, to Thailand, to Vietnam, and that in many, many countries of the East, this seed, also the seed of anthroposophy, has grown in a very special way. And now in our time, it is possible in a very new way to work together and find this balance, this cooperation of East and West for the new future of human society. So maybe you can say this uh, lies already in the, the nature of anthroposophy. Rudolf Steiner, the end of his life, was able to put into the foundation stone of the anthroposophical society these words about the East and the West, and how in the middle, this new impulse of Christ can work, I would like to say, as a, a healing impulse for the world. So, what was Kyle Koenig's connection to the census? Of course, when he spoke in the United States about the census, he spoke in a very special way about the so-called lower senses. And this, I think, is a very special part of his teachings because out of the connection to children, also youngsters and adults with special needs, he had very particular experiences of how the incarnating human being needs to connect, particularly to the lower senses, to build the lower senses out of the process of incarnation, of taking hold of the human body, being at home in a human body on this earth. So there are the senses of incarnation that had so much to do with the cause. 
Karl Koenig wanted to serve. The middle senses, of course, the environmental senses, those that connect us to the outside world, that make us citizens of, of this world, of our environment. And then the higher senses, and this is a, also a particular field of work of Karl Koenig, to look to the higher senses as something which belongs very, very strongly to the future of the human being. How, in a way, the development of the higher senses prepare the incarnation, not just of the individual, but the incarnation of the higher being of the human being. The very new birth process for the human being towards the future. Now, let me go back to this time of founding of the inner Campion movement on the Isle of Man, because one of the particular things that Karl Koenig actually worked on there and shared with his young friends was work on the calendar of the soul, the anthroposophical calendar of the soul, the 52 verses for the weeks of the year, the meditative verses. Now, maybe we can see the picture number five of verse 12 of the calendar of the soul, because this is the verse of St. John's week. We are at the moment in St. John's time, summer is St. John's time. And this is a very particular, let's say, um, zenit of the calendar of the soul, because the calendar of the soul begins the meditative path with Easter and rises through Pentecost to the heights of summer, where, and we can read this in the verses, we are able to connect to the higher being of the human, find our spirit self. Going through our connection to nature, to the rhythms of the world, the rhythms of the starry world, through these experiences of the senses actually to really move into the realm of the super senses, finding spirit, human being. So what Koenig was working on very particular also in the last years of his life, was this question of how the senses themselves are the portals to the super sense. And following this, of course, the portal for the human being to his own super sensible, super sensitive being. So, this is the path that he was describing also in the pictures he drew for each of these 52 verses. And you can see, if you look at this verse, this picture, you can see how from above the higher senses are descending. The first of the higher senses being hearing. Hearing is not an environmental sense. First step to super sensible senses. So there we see the ears in the picture and this spirit self in a way descending. You see the picture of the dove descending to the human being. Now let me just say a word about this human being because he's uh, down almost like in a cage in the bottom of the picture, in a frame. And Looking at this picture, I think we can say it is actually a picture of Kaspar Hauser. In a way, Karl Koenig is saying also Kaspar Hauser is a representative of the human being, of humanity. And in this way, he's akin to the Christ being as a representative of the human being. And of course, Kaspar Hauser was deprived of his senses in 12 years of captivity and darkness without meeting 
human beings, without encounter with other human beings. So he was consciously deprived, particularly, of these higher senses. So Kaspar Haus became, one could say, a, a guiding patron of the Kampu movement for Alkonig to this situation. And we see in this picture for St. John's, we see Kaspar Hauser as because they are representative of the fact that we are able in our days and through anthroposophy to understand and practice the higher senses as this portal to the spirit world and as portal to our higher self. In a way, one could say also as a portal to resilience, because how could one go through that torture of 12 years of solitary confinement and then become such a human being, a real human being as a, an example for the rest of history. He still is an example of his humanity today and is still a leading image for so many people. So, there we see Kaspar Hauser in this picture as, let's say, a pioneer of the refugee of our time, building resilience out of these negative experiences, resilience which will not only lead to future life, but will lead also to the possibility to incorporate spirit, the higher being, into the human being. That was something which was the central task that Koenig saw for himself, but also for the company movement. Now let me show you one more picture, or let's say, um, actually three more pictures that belong together. The first one is a picture two, and this is the building that Karl Koenig had built in Scotland, the first Camp Hill Hall, 1962, this was open. So it was exactly the time of his second visit to North America that this building was being put in. And he was, it was important to him that it was a building, a threefold building, the auditorium, the stage, and that the other side of the auditorium, the chapel. And with this picture, we're looking into the chapel. And above the chapel, he wanted a, a staircase. This staircase was to be for the festivals, the staircase where the archangels would descend into the auditorium for the festivals that he would design. Plays he would design also. He wrote plays for every festival. Now, where the stairs meet above the chapel, this was for him the most important part of the building. And he said he wanted the descending dove to be this architectural element in the middle of the stairs above the chapel. So I hope you can see that on the photograph. And when the building was finished and the architect managed to build a descending dove in this architectural way, he was so taken by this image that he immediately said, this needs to be the logo, the letterhead of the Campion movement of the future, 1962. So if we now take the third picture, you will see the first letterhead of the Campion movement, and you can see how the logo, the, the central task, an image of the central task was this descending dove, the question of how the dove of peace, but also the dove of the real spiritual being of the individual can descend, that the human being can find true community, new community, not just racial community or um, national community or whatever, but community of 
human beings of our time. So this became then the logo of the company movement. And if we now take the next picture, which is picture four, there you'll see our own logo. And Campbell Worldwide is using this, let's say, artistic version or an artistic version of this original logo, of this original architectural piece uh, as the logo individually, regionally. You'll find variations in America, in Holland, in South Africa, in Botswana or in Vietnam. It will look different each time. Uh, also in Camp Ghent in New York, with working with elders, it's no longer so much of descending as, of course, a, a process of excarnation also. So um, you can see how this very central question for Karl Koenig, how the individual finds himself as a spiritual individuality, this was the cause, the central theme but also the ideal of the company movement. And still it is for the future. When he spoke about the future task of the company movement, he included very consciously also for the future, the question of the refugee, the question of elder people, the question of the weakest of society and the peace movement, he also included as an area where this attitude, this curative impulse, this healing impulse out of anthroposophy should find a home for the future, a community building home for the future. So I think actually that is a, Art to describe this biography of Karl Koenig and how out of this biography the Campbell movement was born and how actually we stand in the present day, which is not just 60 years after this founding moment in North America, but 80 years after the founding of the Campbell movement in Scotland, that we now stand at a point to ask ourselves, how can this impulse, whatever it's called and wherever it is, serve these needs of today, of the individual finding to his true spirit self and therefore also to new impulses for community of humanity. Thank you so much, Richard for that rich sharing. And um, I wondered if if I could ask you a couple of questions. Um, yeah, of course. That, yeah, yeah. Things that just, um, that really came to me um, in listening to this story of um, Koenig's deed for humanity. Um, I am thinking in particular about the experience that Koenig and Ida Wegman um, had in their expulsion from the Anthroposophical Society in terms of just all of the, all of the factions and um, all of the, the pain that we see in the world today um, and all the division. And I'm wondering if, if you can say anything about the, the healing of that fracture for either one of those individuals and the rebuilding of trust um, that had to occur for their relationship to develop again with the society and also um, on the part of the society as well? Yeah, that's a huge question, of course. <laughs> but um, let, let me say a few things to that. Um, Balcone was very keen that Campil would play a part in this healing process for the future towards the anthroposophic society also. And uh, of course, it's, it's a, it was a very deep injury. It was a very deep, um, uh, let's say, wound, which is not so easily healed. 
So there, there are many, many layers to this. Outwardly, okay, so the anthroposophic society is, is where it is. And, um, of course, many things have come together, the, the world society and to a certain extent. Of course, there, there still are the problems. But um, and nevertheless, uh, many things have gone forwards. And Koenig was very active in trying to heal on this level of the society. But... Um, what he also saw as a, um, a necessity for the ongoing process of healing was to work towards the community impulse of anthroposophy altogether. That's the one side, the community impulse, which which was quite obvious from the beginning. I mean, look back to uh, the turn of the century when, when Rudolf Steiner began to talk about anthroposophy, he immediately began to talk of the social question. And it's it was something which was, um, uh, let's say, ignored to a great degree of, over a long, long time. This uh, social question, to turn to the social question altogether out of anthroposophy um, was so important for him, but also on a very, very everyday level, not just on an institutional level, but on a, on a very day-to-day -day level. So how do we work on the question of the connection of one human being to the other? And uh, so I would say the main healing process that he experienced and I see going forwards is to implement, uh, if I may use that word, anthroposophy um, in everyday social life in such a way that it really takes root in society and takes root in the individual human being. That's what it's about in the end. And I think this wound or this um, these difficulties, uh, this difficulty of destiny, um, it won't be healed by uh, any institutional thing with the anthroposophic society, unfortunately, but it will be healed particularly through individuals following this path of social life, of real social life together. And uh, this this is something that Rudolf Steiner himself talked talked about so many times. Um, and, and I do think that this is one way, hopefully, Karl Koenig's impulse can go into the future that, for instance, his work on the 12 senses, but also his work on the calendar of the soul can be taken up um, by individuals, but by groups of people. This can be worked through and therefore become something of a, a community building impulse. So, by the way, we, we are doing some um, conferences in America next year on the calendar of the soul using the pictures that Karl Koenig drew specifically for this reason, because it belongs to this question of healing. Now, I'm very, very pleased that you put the question the way you did, Paige, because on the one hand, these uh, drawings can uh, lead us on a path of healing for the earth, for our environment, in that we have a new, or that we build a new connection to our environment and to the spirit as environment through the verses of the calendar of the soul with help by Karl Koenig's pictures. And at the same time, this will be healing the um, destiny of anthroposophy. So thank you for that question. That's, that's just, I, I can't uh, um, answer maybe in full, but but that's one one answer to it. And I do hope in the coming year that we will be able to work on these questions in North America. Thank you. Yes, I I think about this um, this reconnection to nature and what it brings to to mind is Steiner's relationship with Felix Koguski um, and yes. what and what came came out of that. Um, and our connection to 
um, to the natural world of which we of which we are certainly a part. Um, and one one other thing um, that that you said that that I found was really interesting. I'm sort of weaving together parts that you said um, that you know Koenig was entering into his teen years um, and the development of the astral and the eye um, as you know the breaking up of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was happening in World War I and yet the creation of a different incarnation of empire um, with the imposed boundaries of European countries after World War I and I'm thinking about the development of, of humankind against the backdrop of empire and imperial forces and this relationship that Koenig felt to those with learning differences out of their common experiences of being outside of society as you described it. Um, and, and his focus on the 12 senses and that Steiner, um, was really giving us an antidote, I think, to imperialism, which is the extreme opposite, um, right, of living into the I organism of another human being and, and meeting another human being. And Koenig speaks so eloquently about the factions um, that were developing at the time um, that he wrote the Camp Hill letter, um, and that have been developed, had been developing, of course, over centuries. And, you know, actually in Koenig's own words, right, he cautions us against the denial of problems within society. And um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you think that that may be true, um, this, you know, this question of sort of the, the 12 senses as sort of an antidote um, to sort of the, the, <laughs> um, the, distorted growth of, of the individual and the eye organism um, and sort of the importance of community. Um, I just wonder if you could speak about that a little bit. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, th also there, there are various layers to that. And one thing I, I would like to say, you mentioned the people with special needs as being refugees, so to speak. Yeah, on the one hand, yes. On the other hand, um, they are anyway, through their being, outside of these boundaries. You see what I mean? Um, these people show us something of general humanity in such a wonderful way. Um, uh, people, people with Down syndrome are so similar, if I may say so, the world over. You know, I, just recently I was in, in Vietnam and meeting people with special needs there. And, you know, it's it's like coming home, so to speak, because these people are so human. Yeah, I, I have to say it like that. And, and so we are brought, that's what I wanted to say with Caspar Hauser also, we meet this level of pure humanity. And and they they don't respect any borders. <laughs> Very often, that's quite a problem, of course, too, you know, I mean, that's a behavioral problem and so on. But uh, they really push us to uh, experience this, but also to do something about it. You know, what, how are we going to take this? How are we going to move with it? Uh, it's not something that needs healing in the usual sense, you know, like uh, behavior needs to be mainstreamed or, or whatever. No, we have to understand what that really means. What are these people telling us? And to this belongs as one aspect, at least one very important aspect, um, the question of the senses. And also there, people with special needs are such wonderful helpers and teachers because they can show us what it's like if you don't have a sense of the word, for instance, or if your sense of thought is so extremely acute that, that we, can, we can even understand what that means. We go through life without knowing what the sense of word on the sense of thought are even because it works so naturally, usually. And there we have people who can show us what it's like, you know, and and we realize, yes, um, this um, totality of the 12 senses is something incredibly important because it is in itself 
um, let's say, a holistic principle. It's not arbitrary that it's 12 senses, you know, next year it could be 13 or 14. No, there are 12 areas that work together within the human being. And we are only truly human if this totality can actually work together. Just like it's it's just this image that we have in, in Christian tradition for Pentecost. You know, that the because Judas was no long, longer part of the uh, of the disciples, um, they were only 11. And the 12th had to be uh, chosen so that Pentecost could take place. This Whitson event, which is also the descent of the dove, could only take place because this totality of the 12 was there. And this this um, uh, motif we can find again and again and again, so that we see, yes, it is so important to understand this totality of the senses and uh, our usual, um, let's say, our usual image of the senses as being environmentally uh, uh, of importance is only one very small side of our sensory being. So, yeah, I think um, that is the reason why Rudolf Steiner said in the first place, the 12 senses, that is the first step to understanding the human being. Because there we, we have this totality. Where else can we find that really, you know? I, I hope that's sort of a, a little answer. But, you know, but certainly uh, people with special needs are wonderful helpers in this because they are outside these boundaries and can help us to take a step outside to look again to the question, what is the human being? Thank you, Richard. Um, we look forward to exploring these and many other questions um, more during the during the conference. And we hope that those of you who joined the special pre-conference pre lecture well, will take something from this rich sharing offered to us by Richard. And we look forward to seeing all of you on Wednesday, August 11th at 1.45. Eastern Standard Time. Richard, thank you again so much. Good. Thank you, Paige, and all the best for this conference too. I think it's so important. Thank, thank you. you.